it's really a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. Uh, and one of the things about, about being here, I guess, which is, which is kind of special, I guess, for me, um, is uh, to be in this extraordinary place. And I think uh, the director, his comments that were made about uh, what was going on here, um, sort of uh, was, very, was very kind and sort of understated the extraordinariness of this particular environment. But one of the things that Mike didn't do, and, and, and he didn't do, the director didn't do, was actually talk about one of the stories that I found online when I was trying to learn a little bit more about Sardinia. It's actually part of the creation story, right? I mean, when you get right down to it, it's part of the creation story. And so what is it, seven days, but in six days, the world was created. That was sort of the story that, that sort of went on. And the story goes that one of the things that happened is that after creation was going on and everything else had been put together, there was a little bit left over. And so creators sort of took a look at this and said, well, you know, we could probably do a little something else. And so lo and behold, Sardinia was created with the little something else that happened to be out there. But then the creator stepped back and looked at it and said, you know, I like that. That's pretty good. I, th I think I did a pretty good job with that. Why don't I just add a little bit more jazz to it? And so now you only had something that was really, really great, but now you had a little more jazz to it. And so when we talk about the extraordinariness of this particular place, we have jazz plus in terms of what it is that we're sort of looking at. So it's great to be here. It's an honor to sort of be here with all of the distinguished guests and all of you that are here at this uh, particular meeting. Um, one of the things that I want to do here is I want to share a few thoughts on the issue of change in tourism. Um, and it'll only be a few because I know coffee is sort of the next thing. I don't want to sort of keep you from that. And, uh, and I know there's some other extraordinary people here that are going to be talking as well. Um, but I also want to challenge you, and I think it's come up a couple of times in some of the comments that have been here, about preparing for change. Um, it's around us now. It's coming. It's going to be even greater. And I think one of the things that we need to be thinking about at this particular meeting is how are we going to sort of cope with it. I believe that the global, regional, and local challenges we face are unprecedented and that our approach to tourism requires disruptive change. First, we must recognize the necessity of change, and second, we must prepare for what will occur. The past 10 years have seen subtle and dramatic shifts, especially in terms of global challenges and competition uh, between destinations and emerging markets at levels not experienced before. Even traditional challenges like crime and tourism have new and more challenging ramifications in terms of what it is that we happen to be looking at. Um, one of the things that I uh, have grandsons, and they always sort of show me these cartoons and stuff like that that happen to be out there, and there are shapeshifters out there that you sort of take a look at. But the basic shape of the tourism industry is changing at both the macro and the micro level. And so when I talk about change, I think that the idea of shapeshifting is appropriate. To shapeshift is to stretch and transform in a heroic way. And oftentimes it requires that particular kind of heroism to be able to make these kinds of things happen. And oftentimes it will require superpowers to be able to accomplish the goal at hand. Shape-shifting is change. It can happen naturally and reflect the way that it uh, is always already underway, or it might occur more dramatically and require a transformer to exercise a, a, super a superpower to deal with the challenge at hand. There is a saying about change that if we try to do things the way that we have always done them, we will end up with the same results. Will it always happen the same way? Can we use a straight line to talk, to link the past to the future? There are real world examples that have been used to make a case against extrapolating the straight line. Probably the most significant for us has been the growing realization that the current and future international visitors to many countries will be completely different. To avoid hitting the wall, there will be a need to bend the path in our thinking and our actions. And some of our most esteemed scientists have actually sort of given us an idea like this one from Einstein, insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. It doesn't happen that way. And so we need to be able to sort of think about moving in some different directions. And so in this particular case, one of the things that we need to consider is to bend the path. When I talked about shape shifting, one of the things that I talked about and I thought about, I thought that was a, a sort of a reasonable way to describe some of the changes that needed to occur. Rich Lyons, who's the dean of the College of Business at uh, Berkeley, uh, California, um, has used this particular phrase as a way to be able to sort of think about doing things differently, bending the path and moving us in a different direction to be able to get at this transformation that's necessary for being able to think about the future. So today, one of the things I'd like to be able to do is to suggest three different things that are going to be relevant, I think, areas that we can sort of talk about, and the list could go on and on and on. But what I want to talk about uh, is three different things. I want to talk about data. Talked about that just a little bit already. I want to talk a bit about policy. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about silos, experience, and ideas, and how these things kind of come together. 
Um, when we sort of look at some of these kinds of issues that happen to be out there, one of the things that, uh, that I see sometimes when we're talking about data in particular um, is that um, we come down and we sort of look at it in the context of naturally. And some of my colleagues that happen to be sort of in the natural resource environmental field don't necessarily look at tourism as one of those kinds of things that they envy, that they're very interested in. And so one of the challenges that we often have here in terms of being able to move forward uh, is being able to think about tourism naturally. Where does it fit? How does it actually work to be able to sort of enhance the overall well-being of some of the kinds of things um, that are sort of underway? I mean, it's not hard for us to imagine whether it's living longer, whether it's wellness, whether it's energy, whether it's spiritual characteristics that are associated with natural environments. There are things that seem to be associated with these natural environments that make people slide up in their chair, uh, grab at their throat and say, you know, I got to have more of that. It's one of those kinds of things that's absolutely pivotal in terms of being able to move forward. When we talk about these kinds of things, often the use of natural environments, and Mike talked about it a little bit earlier when he started, was to talk about some of the kinds of information that we have and that we use when we talk about um, uh, how it is that people actually use natural environments. When we talk about some of the statistics that are there, we talk about barometers, Omar's organization has a tourism barometer that they put out on a regular basis quarterly to be able to sort of talk about what's going on in the world. And then you finally have new kinds of things that we sort of think about that might be associated with things like big data. One of the challenges I think we have, we have when we sort of look around the room, people that you deal with, is that oftentimes the students that we work with, capacity building as we sort of look to the future, aren't necessarily people that like data. They've often chosen what we do, our area, because they would not really want to move down the road and think much about statistics or the math or some of those kinds of things that happen to be out there. Or for that matter, even think about data and make sense of it. So I know this kind of stuff, but what does it mean when we sort of move forward? And so sometimes when you think about it, uh, our constituents oftentimes are looking at this as being less important. This is uh, one of the tables out of the July 2016 tourism barometer uh, material that comes out from UNWTO. When you think about change, daring to change, innovation, thinking about how the world is going to shift, one of the things you've got to look at is you've got to look at the data. You go back to 2009, which is that one uh, set of data that's over there on the left-hand side. You can see that when the economic recession came by, uh, things went to hell in a handbasket when you sort of look at what it is was going on out there sort of in the landscape. A lot of destinations had serious, serious issues and had to wrestle with how they were going to move forward to be able to deal with these kinds of things. But then things began to change and things began to get better and on a monthly basis you begin to see patterns um, that are interesting and seem to be regularly consistent over time. What does that mean? So what? So if I tell you that I'm going to increase the number of visitors by three and a half percent every single year, is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? What do I need to do to be able to accommodate those kinds of shifts that happen to be out there? If you look at the most recent stuff that's coming out, the stuff that's being reported into the barometer, Asia is, is exploding in terms of the, no, the amount of visitation. Canada's about level. Um, and they have some economic challenges in terms of how it is that they're moving forward. And the mix is changing in terms of how it is that you see visitors around the world. What do those data mean when we have to sort of think about changing and preparing for change as we sort of look down the road? We see examples of it. You actually look at Orlando. This is out of the newspaper here just about two weeks ago. Orlando, when you look at some of the stuff that's going on, is actually slowing down. Disney World, you know, the world of sort of um, Walt Disney and the crowd that happened to be out there. Why is it slowing down? You take a look at the data. They talk about it in terms of visitors. They talk about it in terms of spending. Spending is actually increased slightly. Why? Because they raise prices. But they have fewer visitors in terms of people that are actually coming in. Why are there fewer visitors? The exchange rate between Canada and the United States, Canadians spend a lot of time down in Orlando, um, is actually not very good right now. It's about 130. Two years, 18 months ago, it was about 103, 105. So the exchange rate is not as attractive. The Brazilians, which are often a really big part of that market, are having serious economic challenges in terms of what's going on. They're not coming. They're not coming to that particular place. Orlando says, well, we expected it, right? But if some of these kinds of things persist a little bit longer, how does Orlando make changes to be able to deal with that uh, in terms of price increases? And then there was an international visitor that was murdered. Uh, in Orlando, and it became very prominent in terms of some of the reporting that took place in different parts of the world. How do you deal with those kinds of issues as you sort of look forward? And then I'll look at a place, just as, a, as an example, we could talk about lots of these around the world. 
um, just up the road from where we happen to live right now in terms of Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, Rocky Mountain National Park in 2015 had a 21% increase in the number of visitors that actually came to the park. It actually moved it from the fourth most attended national park in the United States to the third most attended national park in the United States. This year, that growth is probably on par. If not, it will grow more in terms of people coming to Rocky Mountain National Park. It's the 100th anniversary of the National Park Service, and they've advertised like crazy to be able to get people to come out and actually participate in visiting the national park. And so, in some ways, they've met their objective and their goal in terms of being able to move forward. But if you happen to live in the town of Estes Park, which is right outside the gateway to the national park, one of the things that you know about that place is that they're trying to actually write a new strategic plan that says, how do we deal with traffic congestion? How do we deal with the increase in the number of visitors that are coming to this community to be able to go into the national park? And where do people live? Where will people live who have to work to be able to provide the services that happen to be there? And so on the one hand, you're excited about the amount of change that might take place when it comes into the community. On the other hand, you say to yourself, have we been able to address all of the different kinds of things that are going on out there? And so you see this kind of thing that's beginning to happen in a lot of places in the world. This happens to be out of the local newspaper, again, where we are, long lines, congestion, and stuff like that. What does it do to the experience of the visitors that come there? And if they don't have a good experience, will they come back? Will they be interested in the kinds of things that you've got going on right now? In Utah, right next to where we happen to live, what they've had is a mighty five commercial advertising program to get people to come into five big national parks that are there. It's been extraordinarily successful, all right? And economists in the room, I will tell you that they report that they have uh, an ROI of $226 to $1 for what they put in there. Now, if you believe that, all right, then I have a bridge I can sell you after we get done here. But one of the things that you need to sort of think about is that it has been extraordinarily successful. On the other hand, the police finding a three-mile um, traffic jam to try and get into some of these kinds of places have had to shut the place down and told people to go away. And so on the one hand, you're excited about the people that are coming. On the other hand, you have different kinds of issues that happen to be out there um, and that you wrestle with as you sort of move forward. But we're not the only ones in the world that are interested in being able to do these kinds of things. Concurrently, right now in China, there is a meeting that's going on that has this title on it, right? And the thing that they're actually working on is thinking about where does this fit in the larger mix uh, of things that are happening at the, uh, uh, at the table for developing tourism in China. So transitions are happening in other parts of the world. And you look at the distribution of national parks in China, it's exciting and they're extraordinary in terms of what it is that you see when you happen to go there. Much as we talked about some of the places that we think bring us serenity and energy and all those kind of well-being, longer life and stuff like that, there are amazing places in China that you will go to um, and that will sort of make you stop and do a double take because they happen to be out there. The thing that you see when you're doing that, though, is that when you think about some of the challenges that we've got and when you think about where this is going with regard to China, there are some issues there that are going to be impactful in terms of how you do it from a resource side and how you do it from a visitor side in terms of being able to sort of move forward. And then you have these kinds of things, right? Two weeks ago, the meeting with the White House uh, in the United States talking about the Zika virus and what's going to happen as a result of this particular sort of um, uh, image of growth and change that might sort of occur in that particular environment. And if you talk to entomologists and you talk about some of the kinds of things that are associated with issues like climate change, I had to put this picture in because I used to live here and I, I've sort of stood by that bowl on more than one occasion. But the image is that when you start talking about climate change and you start having melting, even downtown Wall Street, which is where this is, uh, in essence will be sort of underwater. And then I, having been here and, and sort of thought about this, I keep trying to figure out how they took the picture in Shanghai to be able to sort of get that. But basically the water uh, that's going to have an impact on the community when we start talking about the stuff that's going on. Climate change, when you talk to an entomologist, they're saying, it's going to come and things that we've never seen before in different kinds of destinations are going to be pronounced. We're going to see them and we'll have to wrestle with that. And so the challenges that we've had in the United States of not dealing with this, now it may change, but not dealing with this, is only going to sort of be ramped up and we'll see other kinds of things that actually go on. 
So what happens then when you start looking at these kinds of things with regard to environmental issues? That's one side of the equation, one side of the equation. The other side of the equation that you would sort of look at is what happens when the mix changes. You happen to be in Australia, those of you that are in Australia. The thing that you know that you're thinking about right now is the five countries that actually contributed most to your visitor populations ain't going to be the new five, right? It's going to change dramatically. And so you see different parts of the country that are actually making decisions about how do we prepare our people to provide services to a completely new audience of visitors are going to come in. So you've got parts of Australia in the school system that have actively sort of addressed introducing Chinese so that when the Chinese come to visit that part of Australia, they'll be prepared to be able to sort of deal with that. But you see this in a lot of different parts of the world when you're talking about the stuff that's going on. The data will give us an idea about how it is we might think about and actually deal with some of these kinds of issues. And then you have this other one here. If students don't like to deal with regular statistics and visitor and expenditure data that we look at, they ain't really strongly convinced that this sort of notion of dealing with big data is going to be one of those kinds of things that's going to impact them. Um, but we know, we know that in fact that in, is going to be the case and it is going to be one of those kinds of things that we are going to have to cope with. If you actually take a look at, uh, there used to be a slide out there, an advertisement in a lot of magazines, are you an IBMer? Why is it an IBMer? is one of those kinds of people that in some way, shape, or another is involved in a lot of this smart planet. And so the idea in here is being able to sort of have a different worldview when in fact you see big data influencing the decisions that are often being made sort of out there on the ground in terms of being able to move forward. In most cases, when you look at it, it's utilities and healthcare and financial entities that have actually been biggest players in, this, in, the, uh, in the big data world and in sort of creating the smarter planet and environment. There are not many directors of destination organizations that have been invited to the table to be able to sort of talk about this. And yet I can tell you, I can tell you that in five years, in every one of the communities that you work with, that one of the things that you'll have to think about is how do you monitor big data that defines experiences that are people, people are having in your community. I was looking at an advertisement just before I came here about people that are designing jewelry, attractive jewelry, that people would wear that in essence has a microchip in it. And one of the things that it does is it monitors. It monitors your health and how you feel. And it can actually sort of give feedback about how it is that things are sort of moving forward. That's going to happen. And the visitors that come to your particular place are going to have that kind of resource associated with it. And when that data starts coming in in real time, in real time, and you have to say, should I tweak something? Should I mess with something? Should I fool with something? The thing that you're going to have to sort of consider is what might that sort of look like. IBM, um, smart company, one of the things that they've actually been doing is they've actually been sort of working on this whole travel 2020 stuff, distribution issues that are out there. How can I help you create experiences that will enhance your profitability out there in the workspace? And it all is tied in many cases to the idea of being able to enhance the world with this sort of smart planet, smart tourism. Scotland. Um, in essence, what's happened is that their Council of Technology, uh, Information Technology, is actually working with the tourism industry to be able to sort of move this particular agenda forward. And you can see in Barcelona, there was a meeting of cities that actually came together um, to be able to talk about these kinds of things. And if you actually take a look at Venice, Venice has actually got some of the best work I've seen done uh, on the use of smartphones and mobile phones to be able to sort of move forward. Um, and being able to sort of think about how it is that we might sort of monitor these new kinds of data opportunities, big data opportunities that are sort of out there on the ground. But it's not as simple as that, right? When we talk about some of these kinds of things, we also know that policy is an important thing out there on the ground. I'm going to use two examples. Um, I didn't use the U.S. one because we don't have an explicit statement of national policy in the United States. It comes from the president who writes an executive order, and we go from there. It's always fun to talk to students about that in the international policy class that I sort of teach. One of the things that you'll actually see in here when you sort of move forward, and you think about Omar's comment about uh, the work that they do in terms of dealing with developing countries. This is a developing country. It's a developed country, but it's a developing country, right? Because the thing that they've now decided is important for them to move forward with is to deal with tourism. And so now what they have is they have a strategy. And they're going to move this strategy forward across the country. And not only are they going to deal with tourism, but they're also going to deal with the issue of leisure and get people to sort of think about what that sort of looks like. With some of the Chinese students in the MTM program that I've actually spoken with, 
um, they sort of roll their eyes and slide to the floor, and we have really interesting conversations about what this might look like. This is an amazing document when you read it. They have to change the whole infrastructure of the country. They have to actually train people. Talk about capacity building. Wow, when you start talking about what's going on. And if we were to throw India on a table, and India came out, they're training 200,000 people to be involved in the tourism industry, uh, life gets even more exciting in terms of how it is that you sort of move forward. But it, this doesn't happen in China. If you actually take a look at the EU, the EU talks about three different things to me that are interesting. Collaboration, one thing, we talked about it here locally, that that's an important ingredient in terms of moving forward. But the thing in here that blows me away, quantity, we want to enhance the quantity, the number of people that are actually coming to this particular area. Wow. No downside to that. Everybody sort of wants to be able to play that game. But we have a little competition, maybe, in terms of what's going on. And Omar told us that the world is going to change. 50% of the arrivals is going to be in developing countries. So now, Europe and the EU has an interesting challenge in terms of being able to move forward. But the one that really gets me in this one is quality. Is quality. We're going to improve and make decisions about how to improve the quality of the experience. Maybe that's the differentiating factor. How do you measure quality? How do you measure quality? You have 50, 60 people in this room. It would be really interesting if we went around and we had that particular conversation. But that's what they want to do. And if you want to be competitive, and if you want to be a player in the world, it's one of the kinds of things you're going to have to do more and more. So when we talk about competition, we talk about these kinds of issues, we talk about quantity and growth, we talk about quality, we talk about changes in the mix in terms of what's going on, we talk about um, the developing countries and the role that they will play in terms of providing tourism services. It's going to be a real, real interesting challenge. We talk about the idea of collaboration, talk about coordination uh, and being able to move forward. One of the things that you sort of talk about, you, it's explicit in terms of the way that they write down what it is that they want to do. Claire Gunn wrote a book in 1972, it's called Vacationscape, Developing Tourist Areas. And one of the things that he talked about in there was to actually come back in and say, there are two things at least that we need to be sensitive to. We need to be sensitive to the idea of cooperation and coordination and we need to pay attention to experience. And when he went back and he sort of talked to me with some people that were out there on the ground, he said, we have some real interesting challenges. We've got to do a better job with being able to sort of move forward and deal with some of these kinds of issues. But experience and silos were the things that he sort of got to in terms of being able to move forward. Coordination and cooperation isn't easy. You know that. You know that when we talk about that. And you talk about sort of the challenges that Sardinia has in terms of being able to move forward. It's not an easy thing to do. If you go back in and you talk with some of your executive directors and presidents of the Convention and Visitor Bureau Destination Marketing Organization that you might have close by, and you actually ask them what they're doing with regard, have they been invited to the table, for example, to talk about economic development, now talked about economic health in a lot of places, the answer is often no. I have, they don't invite me to those kinds of meetings. And yet we're here talking about the level of involvement in terms of economic activity that's extraordinary for tourism. Why is that the case? And if we talk about smart tourism, we talk about the changes that are going to take place there, then in fact one of the things you've got to look at is you've got to think about some things that are going to have to be done differently. Um, I guess if I move forward, that's probably a good thing here in terms of being able to do this. Um, and I take no credit for this quote, although I think it's a really good one here. I was reading Food and Wine magazine, and it's an advertisement for, uh, for pasta. Actually, right? So don't just set the table, set the mood, right? That's what we want to be able to do. Claire said 40, 50 years ago that one of the most important things we need to be thinking about is the idea of experience. And clearly that's one of the things that's really, really significant. I think that as we move forward and think about the stuff that we have to do in tourism naturally, that one of the areas to me that's really quite interesting is this broad area of creative tourism. A lot of it in terms of the theory and the work that was done was developed in Europe. It sat around for about 20 years. It seems to be coming back here in terms of some of the stuff that's going on. Richard did a bunch of this stuff way back once upon a time. But I think the combination of creative tourism and big ideas, new ideas that need to be factored onto the table are really key. When you look at some of the UNESCO stuff that's gone on here with this particular uh, bundle of stuff, you can see a lot of connections around the world for people that are doing uh, work in a whole array of areas. But I think as we look to the future, I think as we talk about daring to change, this is one of the kinds of things that's really critical uh, in terms of being able to sort of think about where it is that we're going to end up going. So when we talk about these kinds of things and we talk about sort of this notion of how do we find our way in these turbulent times, and I think they will be turbulent, I think they will be challenging and they'll be sort of hard to deal with. And one of the things that we'll see 
because we're going to see people that are going to give us guidance about how it is we do this. This is the report that came from the Destination Marketing Association International that talks about what they think is going to happen through 2020. It's an incredible agenda. It would be an incredible thing from an academic point of view to do research about. From a practitioner point of view, it's extraordinary in terms of just figuring out how in the heck are you going to do a lot of the kinds of things that are out there. But they include the ingredients that I've been talking about in terms of being able to move forward. And one of the points that Omar made here when he was talking about before is to also be thinking about how tourism will be impacted um, in the context of behavior, but also by information technology. The SCIF Manifesto, you get it online if you want to look at it, also talks about this in terms of being able to move forward. So we have some challenges. We have some things that we need to be thinking about, even in terms of just the three years that I sort of talked about. I said that Lyons talked about this idea of being able to bend the path. That that was one of the things, we can't do things the way that we used to do them in the past. We need to bend the path and we need to do things somewhat differently. We come to this quote uh, by Robert Frost. Um, we need, we have work to do. We need to focus on community and improving the social and economic well-being of the citizens and creating great experiences for the visitors. I began by saying that tourism is facing challenges and undergoing change. There are some who resist change. As leaders in tourism and related organizations, you recognize this is not an option. Like the Robert Frost quote, we are going to have to make some tough choices, and I think the choice must be the road less traveled. It will be hard, and will take a lot of heat for pursuing initiatives that are perceived to be radical and dramatic, even risky, yet they must be done. A recent UNWTO report suggests that big impacts and changes will become the rule. The status quo doesn't work any longer. We need to shape shift with new disruptive and transformative ideas on the road less, uh, less traveled. We need to bend the path. Extreme impacts required a reframed look to take us into the future. We must immediately begin to plan for transformation and shape shifting that address a changing population, delivery systems, coordination, collaboration, and action. In action, which I think is critical. And at the beginning, middle, and end of the day, we ask the question whether we have we have the audacity to dare to change. I believe you are prepared to lead this change. And I challenge you to leave this meeting with a commitment to making it happen. And with that, thank you. Um, you know, one of the, when we think about the future, I think either, if it's from climate change or political uh, events, you see a big issue arising with immigration. And so we have Europe faced with one version of that. We have a presidential candidate. Budget another view. I was waiting for the laugh. But he is a legitimate candidate. I mean, he has another view. And I just wonder if you could address you know, how so, something so significant that will happen in the future, immigration, maybe something we should think about. Immigration, and, and certainly our European colleagues that are here, have wrestled with a lot of the different kinds of issues that are associated with, with immigration, immigration, um, people in various kinds of things of, of trying to escape political turmoil around the world. I mean, we can kind of go up and down through the list. And it's had an impact on you. It's had a big impact on the way in which citizens perceive uh, what's happening uh, with, with other people that are sort of coming into the country. Um, and I think that'll continue to grow. I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. And I think that one of the comments that was made here about being able to, to craft a conversation that begins to enhance and improve the ability of people to understand um, what some of the opportunities and challenges are and what some of the problems are and that kind of thing is going to be, uh, is going to be interesting. Um, in our country, if you talk to international visitors that actually come to the U.S., and some of you that have done this, you may agree or you may not, but I know some of my colleagues that have come in are often put off by um, going through Homeland Security and all of the things that have got to go on with fingerprinting and eye scanning and all this other kind of stuff that goes on. And it, and it makes them make the decision not to come. They simply won't come. They won't come back. And if they make a decision not to come back, then what's the likelihood that, the thing, that what they'll say to their, to their friends and colleagues, you know, you could go to, you, could go, you should go to Sardinia. You should go to, uh, 
you know, you should go to some other place because those people are crazy. They, they just simply don't really want you and there's nothing that they're doing to be able to sort of enhance. And, and I would even say that in our country, in our country, one of the challenges that we have is that we have a very, very, um, often have opportunities with many, many people from different parts of the world. And most of the people that are at the airports don't have the ability to speak any of the languages that happen to be out there. Maybe Spanish, maybe Spanish, sometimes a little French, not much Chinese, right? And you start talking about some of these kinds of things. And, you know, the thing we came to the airport, we lost our luggage last night when we sort of came into town. I will tell you that the people in the El Garo airport, um, uh, their, their, their English is pretty good, pretty good. But they went out of their way to do everything they could to sort of enhance our experience in trying to fill out the forms to be able to sort of come into the country. Um, and so we often don't see that. We often don't see people seeing that as that responsibility. Oh, I, immigration, I think, will increasingly become an important ingredient um, in terms of, of how it will impact the stuff that goes on. But I think there's going to be a lot of pushback from an awful lot of people um, that don't want other people, period, whether they happen to be an immigrant, uh, or they happen to be a visitor that comes from another place coming into their particular destination. I think it's just a challenge we're going to have to wrestle with. And it's a conversation, creating that conversation to improve the stuff that we do. Go ahead. In terms of overcrowding, do you think some of the best solutions are going to be cost raising or price raising or a lottery system? Can you just talk about what you think some of the options are for dealing with overcrowded tourist destinations? So now you're talking about that interesting stuff in sustainability, right? So some of that stuff I think will happen, and it's already happening in a lot of different places because it, it enhances the bottom line from an economic perspective of a lot of businesses that actually work. In general, you still see the data that comes back that says visitors don't say that they're willing to spend more to be able to sort of do things that might sort of enhance the environmental conditions that are in a particular area. It, 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 there's a small group of people that will, but in general, um, that's going to be a challenge. In some of these places, I think one of the things that you're going to see is you're going to see a continual wrestling with the whole theme of experience. And, and will congestion continue if one of the things that happens is your experience is awful? Will you come back and go to that particular place? Will you tell other people to come to that particular place? In some places, it'll happen. It'll happen at, at certain places because they're really special. But then the organization that's out there is going to have to say, we have a responsibility to the resource. So we need to do some things to be able to accommodate the visitors that are actually coming in here and be able to sort of protect the resource and whatever. And it's going to be an interesting sort of balancing. The resource agencies, in my opinion, are so far behind where they need to be in thinking about these kinds of things that it blows you away. There's a meeting in Banff, Alberta, um, last week, actually, where the organizations from Canada and the United States were together talking about some of these kinds of things. But if they had their choice and they could actually vote on it, there's a pretty good chance that they wouldn't vote for visitors. They would actually vote in some other ways to be able to sort of move forward. It's, it's a challenge. And I think that some of the other things that will happen here, we talk about some of the costs, um, is when you talk, I showed you the picture of, of, um, of Rocky Mountain National Park. I told you it's 21 percent, it's going to go up again and stuff like that. It's going to be the, the gateway communities that are around those places. How do we create a situation where it can be a win-win for both, so social exchange there, right? A win-win situation for the people that are there um, in the community, as well as a win-win situation for the people that come from outside. Because if it's not a winner for the community, then it's going to be the not in my backyard approach that people will want to use, and that's going to be a challenge. And that's going to be what's going to happen in China. China is going to grow domestically, because that's one of the agenda items that happens to be there. And it's going to grow dramatically internationally in terms of visitors coming in. You have such beautiful, beautiful parks in many of the places that are there, some of which are used a lot, many of which are not used much, right? But when you start getting that influx, and particularly when you don't have communities and a lot of residents close by that haven't necessarily been around that much, or even, for that matter, resource professionals that are responsible for managing that, it's going to be hard. It's going to be... Mike doesn't like it, but it's going to be a wicked problem. <laughs> it's going to be one of those wicked problems that you've got to deal with. So, yeah, I think it's going to be, uh, it's going to be John. It's going, to cost, it's going to cost money to prepare, and there's no way around it, and so we'll have to figure out how best to do that. Daring to change.
that's an interesting question. But one of the things in, in the United States, I will. Huh? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, um, make sure I get it right. Sort of. Um, so when you look at the the data that's gathered in various countries, um, countries have maybe a vested interest in being able to have good numbers, yeah. right? But how do you keep them from cheating? Right? How do you keep them from cheating? Um, and, and that's an interesting problem when you sort of look at it. Um, Jerry sort of will go back and sort of think about this a little bit. I was always surprised in our own country, even when the economy was bad, that U.S. Forest Service, National Forest visitor arrivals never went down. It never decreased. And it's impossible to believe. I mean, it's just impossible to sort of accept that. But, but they didn't want it to go down because it would affect their bottom line and the revenue that would come in to manage the resource. In general, when you take a look at people that are in the statistical agencies that collect these kinds of data, they're very, very reputable and, and have a high level of, of concern that they provide quality information in terms of what's going on. And, and, and you know, Omar said, going back to the TSA stuff, I remember I mean, in Ottawa and then in Nice and some of these other places where these things were discussed, I was always struck by the fact that they were really sort of wanted to be it to be right and correct, and not sort of cheap. That wasn't sort of the story. Now, it's not to say it doesn't happen in some places, and I would almost guarantee, and I would almost guarantee it does in some places, because they don't have the capacity, they don't have all of the, the, the team that they need and the resources to be able to make, but they have to provide data, and so they do. A standard, some, standardized way of providing data. Can yeah, yeah, so, so it's, but in general, when you sort of look across the world, I would say that it's pretty reputable, and so when you take a look at the stuff that's there, it's sort of okay. In the barometer, you have sort of two different things that happen in there. You actually have measures of statistics that talk about um, sort of, you know, statistically um, uh, qualified people that are gathering the data on arrivals. The second thing that they do, though, is they actually have a, um, a, almost like a focus group across the world, 500, 600 professionals, where they ask what's happening. And so in a sense, it's the qualitative feedback. So if all of a sudden somebody said things ain't going very good, but you have a big jump in your numbers, somebody would step back and say, are you sure? 